Even in the depths of winter, the quays in Baltimore are busy as ferries make their way to the nearby islands of Cape Clear and Shirkin. Cape Clear's fortunes have changed over the years from a traditionally strong fishing community to one that is more likely to be reliant on tourism. One way of looking at the reversal of the island's fortunes can be seen in the fact that while there are about 120 houses on the island, the midwinter population stands at about 100. Even so, the island, which is noted for its entrepreneurial initiatives, is dealing with a serious housing crisis. The lack of housing is having a direct impact on the local school where the number of pupils has fallen to four. Without additional accommodation, the islanders feel they will not be able to attract new young families and that the long-term impact on the island will be a long, slow decline, similar to what happened with the island's fishing industry. Taking a journey to Cape Clear, whatever the weather, is a pleasure, which has ensured its place as a valued tourism destination of the West Cork coast. But islander Mary O'Driscoll, who is working on an exhibition that will illustrate the island's proud fishing tradition, gives context to what made the fishermen of Cape Clear master mariners. I'm working on a project um, cataloguing and uh, getting the history of a collection of photographs that were done by a uh, local fisherman, Patrick O'Driscoll. And so uh, his collection was destroyed or partially destroyed during Storm Christine uh, many years ago and had, they've been lying in boxes. So now this, uh, over the next few months, we're taking them out of the frames, scanning them, uh, copying them, putting them back together again, but saving the originals. And we're also recording Pat to give us the history of each picture. I have um, living evidence still of the fishing industry just after the famine. Uh, there was a proselytizing mission where uh, the minister came, set up uh, a mission here, and they built the fishermen's cottages in the lane who are, that are still here to this day, and they had a fishing boat in the harbour as well. So we can find it back as far as there. Uh, and then, you know, moving forward quickly, um, at the end of the 1800s, there was a very, um, what would you say, a priest in Baltimore who had great foresight and he contacted a lady called Lady Angela Burdett Coutts, who was a friend of Queen Victoria's and a benefactress. So she uh, gave loans, interest-free loans, to the fishermen in Baltimore and the surrounding area and Cape Clear as well. And so they ended up um, succeeding in having a fleet like this where there were so many boats in the harbour and so many people fishing. I do have the numbers. I think there were about eight crew on every boat. Maybe there were 20 odd boats fishing out of Cape Clear. And that would have been at the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. So it was very lucrative and it was the main stay of living here. And as well as fishing, the men would fish all the week and then they'd come home at the weekends and they'd uh, have some rest and relaxation, probably in the pub. And the wives and children would come to the harbour and they would uh, salt the fish, I don't know if I've got a picture of it here, put them into barrels. And then we had a man on the island called Kieran Cotter, who was an ancestor of the current Kieran Cotters. Uh, he would export them to the New York fish market. And the, the, the logo that they were called were the three seas, Cotters Cape Clear. And they were taken by a coaster just off the harbour, brought to New York and sold salt fish from Cape Clear in the early 1900s. During the 1970s, I started fishing out of Cape Clear. Fishing is in our blood. Go back to the 1830s, my great grandfather had a boat and fished up to the famine. And during the famine, he had to stop fishing because there was no market. Uh, he got back to fishing again, I think around the late 1850s, 1860. His son then, born in 1849, not sure if he ever fished, but he became a fish buyer and he bought fish uh, up to about 1914. But because of the economic problems of the First World War, the Civil War in Ireland, the War of Independence, that the whole trade finished up. Uh, he, his first wife died in 1909. They were trying to secure barrels on the pier himself and his wife during a storm and she got injured, I believe. And three years later, he married in 1913 and had three in family, two daughters and a son. 
that son, Kieran Cotter, is my father, who was actually went off to college as a young fella, became a civil engineer within 1940-ish, 1939 maybe, bought a boat called the Heaver and fished that up to the 1950s. Then in 1955, he joined up with the Sweeney's in Baltimore and they bought uh, the Radiance first and then a few years later, the St. Gerard. Uh, the skippers of those boats were uh, uh, Dunica Con O'Driscoll and Sean Con O'Driscoll. Pat uh, O'Driscoll, Pat Con O'Driscoll was the mate and Michael was the mate on the other boat. Um, he, when I was, uh, uh, I bought the shop then in 1977 and didn't fish anymore. Uh, and strangely enough, my young fella who never fished, but is also named Kieran Cotter, he's now a civil engineer. Um, and can I ask you, Kieran? Yeah. did I hear you correctly? Did you say there was no fishing because of the famine? Correct. I don't understand. They couldn't sell it. There was no money. The famine really was because there was no money. They couldn't sell their fish. No one had money. The famine, like the, the famine was an economic fa famine as far as I can see, rather than the lack of food. The stores in Ireland, the potato failed. That was the basic diet of the, the Irish people. And, but there was famine all over Europe. This famine wasn't just because of Ireland, but it affected Ireland more. And our, our, I, as far as I know, 13% of the Irish people died during the Irish famine which strangely enough is the same percentage as the amount of people who died during the Ukrainian 1931 famine, uh, which was about 3.9 million. That was also an economic, uh, that was a forced famine by the, the um, Lenin, I suppose, was it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, then, you know, fast forward to sort of the mid 1900s. Um, obviously there was a lull in the fishing everywhere, you know, between sort of 1920 and then there was the war and whatever, and a lot of emigration, a lot of the Cape men left and, you know, went to sea and were renowned at sea for being master mariners and so on. Uh, but then there was a revival again in sort of the end of the maybe 1940s, 1950s. I think there was a, maybe a fund from BIM to help fishing to restart. And so the family, the Sheehan family here, um, uh, had got a boat. Uh, called the Ard Costa. The, you know, the boats in those days, you'd have a series of boats like the Ard boats or the Ross boats or whatever, and Ard was the first word in each of these boats' names. So they were all um, replicas of each other and all over the coast. But we had the Ard Costa. She came here in 1958 um, and has been fished for the most part by the Sheehan family ever since then um, and is still in their family to this day. So she's quite an iconic uh, boat as you can see we're very proud of her unfortunately she's now decommissioned and she's sitting here in the harbour but uh, she's like the icon of the Cape Clear harbour must be the most photographed boat I think in Ireland. Cape Clear Ferries is one of the successful business ventures on the island such is its success that it has added a new fast ferry that will bring visitors in half the time but for now, we return to Mary and the history of the island's fishing industry. Um, I'd like to refer to the O'Driscoll family and Patrick, or Pat as we call him, Pat Khan, who collected these photographs. He and his brothers um, in the end of the 1950s were fishing. And uh, I think with some encouragement and maybe assistance from Kieran Cotter, the, the son of the man who exported to New York and the father of the present Kieran Cotter in Baltimore, um, and so they started off with a boat, I think it was called the Radiance. Um, so they fished her and then they sort of went from strength to strength. And uh, Pat had his own boat that came all the way from Norway. Uh, and his brother Donica was a very progressive fisherman as well. Um, his brother uh, Johnny, as we call him, or Sean O'Driscoll, fishes out of Dunmore East. I uh, don't think he's still fishing, but he's still there. And his brother Michael fishes out of Castletown Bear. So they came from this little island and they sort of developed an empire of fabulous modern fishing boats, you know, progressive and, you know, looking into the future. So it was really successful. Um, and yeah, they, they, he was the one who had the inspiration to collect all these photographs. New Ireland resident Bryony Connolly gives her take on island life. He just actually moved to Cape uh, about two months ago. My, my son is one of the four kids in the school. Um, it's lovely. 
It's um, but yeah, obviously, I think that's that's a struggle that everyone's having. And we wanted to move here much sooner than two months ago, but we there was no housing at all to be had, absolutely none. So um, we did manage to get some through a residency that they that the court commons offered. So luckily, we've been living there. Yay. <laughs> So luckily we're now living here for the last two months and the son's in the school and it's great but obviously yeah there's a dire need very dire need for housing um, there's a lot of empty houses <laughs> there's a lot of holiday homes and um yeah it's a bit sad it's sad actually because we're really desperate for more families we'd love to live here forever to be honest but you know at the moment it's not looking very feasible the thread of the school closing down and yeah it's a sad thing the island co-op is hoping cork county council will grant planning permission for four new houses well this is a beautiful field which is very close to south harbour and cape Fear co-op has applied for a planning permission for gateway housing for this field and what they're hoping to do is they're hoping to build five beautiful or four beautiful family homes in this field so that people can, can have an opportunity to come and live on Cape Fear Island and it's only about 200 metres from the school which is just uh, down there in South Harbour. Cape Clear is full of surprises like turning a corner and finding a film crew interviewing Brian McHugh of Vantage Towers whose company chose Cape Clear for a pilot project to bring mobile and broadband coverage to the island. My name is Brian McHugh, Managing Director of Vantage Towers Ireland. We're over here in, today in Cape Clear uh, as part of our launch of our Towers for Good programme. We've recently developed telecommunications infrastructure in the island, uh, which will provide the platform for mobile and broadband coverage to the island. Uh, our aim is, I suppose, to increase the social and economic benefit to the island, the islanders and the surrounding areas as well. To conclude, Mary O'Driscoll leaves us with a roundup of the industry and an enduring image of the last fishing boat on the island. Cape Clear was once very famous for its fishing fleet. They fished, fished all over the coast of West Cork and that fishing fleet had been uh, started in the early 1900s with help from Lady Bird and Coots and with the vision of Father Davis and his fishery school in Baltimore. Today, unfortunately, we have this very beautiful but the only fishing boat left in the harbour. It's like an iconic picture of Cape Clear because I think any picture of the harbour has to have this beautiful boat in it. She's called the Orcasta and she came here in the late 1950s when there was a fishery revival uh, sponsored by BIM. So she's in the possession of the Sheehan family who have had her pretty well all of that time and still own her. Uh, she's like the little old lady of the fishing fleet to remind us of all those wonderful people who went before us, all those fantastic boats that were in this harbour. And sadly now we just have the art cast with us. We're very fond of her and we love her to bits and we're minding her in her retirement.